Okay, this is July 24th, and I'm doing an interview with Marcos Dimas. Marcos, we'll begin uh, just generally in terms of your own life, uh, you know, when you were born, where, your early childhood, that that thing. All right. Well, yeah, well, I, yeah, I could start talking about that, of course. Uh, I grew up in, well, I was born in Puerto Rico, and... Um, Spend the first, I think, about eight years of my life in Puerto Rico. So my formation is uh, is uh, Puerto Rico, Latino, Spanish, whatever, Catholic, um, you know, nature. And um, then my parents, my we come from a family that worked. Well, my parents' family was from uh, the sugar cane. Uh, industry, the plantation. My mother, my my mother was from El Pueblo, and they were. Uh, my grandfather was in, uh, uh, a shoemaker, and uh, and the sons were all tailors. But on my father's side, we, they all worked at at the at the plantation. Uh, um, so when you say plantation, uh, coffee, sugar, sugar, Su sugar, sugar cane. Okay, sugar cane plantation. Yeah, and uh, so I spent my also my early childhood between the the town and the and the country, you know, which wasn't like about a mile apart, you know. Yeah, so it was like. Um, so uh, so I as my first years, my formation years were in Puerto Rico. In what uh, part? What? In Cabo Jojo, Puerto Rico, which is the southwestern tip of the island. Um, and um, and then uh, what started to happen was a lot of the uh, the agricultural uh, a lot of the farms started being sold, the, uh, and then. Puerto Rico was like in the transition between agriculture and and uh, and and uh, factories. The factories started coming in, so a lot of people started selling their lands, uh, and then um, they were out of work. So we came to New York, and we came to New York, and uh, so I came to New York. I started school in the third grade in New York City. And uh, I've lived there basically from there on. Um, you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have one sister. I have one sister. My, my parents just had a couple, uh, a girl and a boy. And then, uh, but I have a lot of, cause, well, we had cousins here already that were here. We had family, we had family in New York that came over in 1917, you know. So they they were the first migration. Yeah, the first migration. They they were they, they were here. So so there was always a link. So they we were they would take us in. You know, we have family in New York also. So uh, the extended family took us in till we till we um, uh, till we got settled. You know, got an apartment, uh, saved some money, bought an apartment. Those those days you had to buy the apartment. You know, um, and this is what borough. I came into the the Bronx. The Bronx. Yeah, into the into the South Bronx. Um, so yeah, so and uh, you know I went to school after that. So everything else is like been uh, New York based, uh, and um, I went to school. I went to. Uh, I finished elementary school, I went to junior high school, then high school, and then um, I studied uh, uh, tailoring in high school at the High School of Fashion Industries, keeping it with, with, with the tradition of my family. And um, then I was called to service for the Vietnam War. Uh, went in, then when I came out, I went to Based on with the GI Bill, I went to. I, then I started my uh, formal art education, and um, went to the School of Visual Arts. 
Um, when I was at the School of Visual Arts, I got involved with, uh, with, with uh, some artists. Uh, there was a, like a handful of Puerto Rican artists at that time in the school. And, um, and uh, what was happening too, the, the school, the School of Visual Arts was liberal. Uh, there, there was a lot of, a lot of the teachers were teaching, were teaching artists. Uh, there, there was, uh, they were involved with the movement. So we had, there was, um, there was an affinity to the movement, you know, the social movement happening. Uh, then there was a group of uh, artists called the Art Workers Coalition. So we became part of that. We, uh, I say we, like uh, the handful of Puerto Rican artists that were involved, that were at the school, became part of it. Do you remember some names of that group? Yeah, well, the, the, the one person who was uh, sort of like the cacique, the head uh, person, uh, which had been already part of the destructive movement and the avant-garde movements was Rafael. We used to call him Ralph Ortiz, but his, now he calls himself Rafael Ortiz Montañez, you know. Um, and he was part of that. So there was a, a group of, of, of Afro-American artists, which included Tom Lloyd and uh, uh, a few others. I'll think of their names later. And, so, and then there was a group of Puerto Rican artists among the group, a larger group of just international, uh, all... You know, all colors, all nationalities. It was an art workers coalition. It was just artists, an artist uh, for social justice, whatever. You know, uh, and uh, so some of the uh, the agendas were uh, against the Vietnam War. You know, there was protests against the Vietnam War that we were involved with. Um, when the Kent massacre. Uh, um, thing happened where they killed uh, a couple of students in Kent State. Uh, we decided to have a, a citywide uh, boycott of the museums, uh, a shutdown uh, in, in in protest. And uh, so there were like factions sent out to different museums to sort of like uh, close them down. And um, we did a series of demonstrations, uh, and um, and and that led to the idea of us forming together as a group, you know, as 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 as, as a group to create a cultural uh, entity in East Harlem. Uh, but some of the museums. Uh, First of all, first we, we demonstrated against the Museum of Modern Art. The Museum of Modern Art was having an exhibition of the Surrealists. And uh, the art workers felt that the Surrealist uh, movement didn't want, that, that was their purpose, to, to be anti-establishment. Uh, uh, so they shouldn't have been exhibiting, uh, you know, the Surrealist movement in the Museum of Modern Art. So there was a a general uh, boycott of, of the museum, a demonstration with street uh, guerrilla art, theater, guerrilla theater uh, presentations in the street, and and uh, and, and then uh, we um, uh, decided that one of the issues uh, there wasn't enough uh, black Puerto Rican and female representation in all these uh, institutions. So then there was a series of, of um, demonstrations against the Museum of Modern Art and other museums. Uh, um, there was one incident where we took over uh, Thomas Hoving's office, the Museum of Mar uh, the Metropolitan Museum, uh, demanding that they um, become more sensitive to the population at large, you know, be inclusive, uh, and and the and the community around them, and around them, yes, yes, uh, and especially particularly that museum because uh, we the, that museum is partly funded by the tax, uh, you know, twenty percent of the uh, uh, for twenty percent of the people, you know, twenty percent of 
taxes. Of the tax, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and um, so, so we did that. They became more sensitive. They started doing other things. The, oh, another museum was the Museum of the City of New York which was right in our community, in East Harlem. They were at uh, Fifth Avenue at 104th Street. And they had no relation to the community at that time. Uh, the museum was basically a museum that housed the colonial uh, um, culture of New Amsterdam and, and, the, and the, the formulation of Manhattan. So uh, we demonstrated um, against that museum, and, and that brought about where they hired a community liaison person to start dealing with the community. So we were able to get start the the museum to relate to the population, creating uh, workshops, doing uh, educational programs, and, and since then they've they've done a marvelous job. You know, in in the, the so, but that was the beginnings of it. You know, we were we were involved with the beginnings of, of all all that uh, all those the changes. The community liaison was the Museo del Barrio that, uh, yet coming on board, or was it just beginning? Or well, it's interesting because at that same time, the Museo del Barrio, Rafael Tiz Montañez was the he was the um, um, the architect the. the the person behind the idea of the Museo del Barrio, and um, and us, we being part of that art workers faction, which were Puerto Ricans, then we became part of the uh, uh, um, the, the, um, the advisory board uh, to the yet to become Museo del Barrio, and. Um, uh, we furnished, you know, we, we did research with, with, with uh, bringing images to deal with and, and concepts. Ralph, Raphael, well, I call him Ralph, but Raphael, his, his concept was very avant-garde, and, and that clashed with, uh, with the administration. He, his concept was Museo de Barrio, was a museum of the streets to create art in the streets and bring exhibitions out. But it was actually a project of the Board of Education, the, uh, the Department of Education of the City of New York. In other words, under the public system. So it clashed with um, with with, uh, <clears throat> with the conservative views of the uh, of the administration and the parents. The parents wanted something that would show, like the cultural Puerto Rico, you know. Uh, you know, High folk, art. yeah, folk, folk art and stuff like that. And Ralph wanted an avant-garde thing, you know. So it just never. So was Marta Moreno Vega also part of that group? No, no, she so came later. Later, on. later, she came later. On. Okay, she came after that because now, by that token, they fired Rafael Ortiz Montañez, and then uh, they, she was hired as a second director of the museo. Yeah, and and so. This workers' coalition then evolved. We're getting now in terms of of, of the taller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the same group of people, which I actually included myself, Adrián Garcia, Armando Soto, uh, Martín Rubio, and um, then we came into East Harlem. We met some organizations there that helped us, so, sort of like grandfathered us into East Harlem. They gave us space to work out of and all that. And that, that organization was called the Urban Planning Studio, which uh, Manuel Otero was part of it. Uh, and they were they were a sprinter group of another organization called the Real Great Society. At that time, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson had the Great Society you know, concept going on. Uh, so, so they called themselves the Real Great Society. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so th they they allowed us to come into their building and use some of the space for talleres. Uh, that's where we started the taller boricua. Yeah. So and the taller boricua was first at this great. What was it? The yeah, the Real Great Society's building. urban planning studios. Okay. Uh, building. Yeah. 
That's that's the first location we had. And it just happens that we were on Madison Avenue, 110th Street, 111th Street, and across the street was the headquarters of the Young Lords Party, you know, which was also another thing that was happening uh, along the, uh, around the same time. So, so then it became, you know, like, it, it became sort of like uh, very dynamic because then we would do activities where we do uh, post posters and, and all that for for the movement. We do posters for the Movimiento Pro Independencia de Puerto Rico, the MPI uh, movement, which had a faction in, in New York City. And other organizations then started to spring up. El Comité was another organization that then started to spring up, which dealt more in the West Side, but with the same issues, you know. So it's, it's a coalition of organizations started to then uh, sort of like grow and in, 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 uh, and become like uh, uh, brothers, uh, more or less, you know. So, so that, 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 that's the, basically like the idea of, of the formation of that Taller Boricua, you know. Personally, I was in the School of Visual Arts and I studied uh, with uh, Malcolm Morley and uh, with a lot of the super realist painters, um, um, Chuck Close, and all, they, they, were, they, they were young artists just teaching there at the time, you know. They, they weren't even famous yet. But th those were our teachers, so we, we had a good group of teachers, and um, and some of my early work was more or less like a combination of, of surrealism and and, and uh, super realism and and, and uh, uh, that type of work. But when when I left the school and started dealing with with this whole new concept, you know, uh, of identity identity politics. If you, if you, if well, that's what we call it. Now, um, so I started to do research uh, along with the museo too. That uh, as the committee, the uh, advisory committee, we started doing research. So we started finding all these images of Taino petroglyphs and Taino uh, art and 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 African art and things like that, and just started bringing it in. So, so that became our research. Uh, uh, um, uh, to 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 create our own art, so we started doing art with the taller, keeping in mind that we had to, uh, you know, not that we had to, but we were, you know, we just wanted to deal with our own culture, you know. So then, so I went, my art, art went from like a, a very like a super realist, like uh, chrome and glass type of look to uh, in sort of like a organic, an organic uh, uh, thing, you know. Uh, uh, With the symbols and the, the, symbol and, and the symbolic yeah, of the Taino. Yeah. And, the and the naturalism, you know, uh, you know, of the painting, handling the paint uh, in a natural, more uh, fluid manner and, you know, relating like back to nature, sort of like with the idea of like, what would be like, uh, you know, if if the Tainos had developed to this stage, what would their art look like? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. With, with that idea in mind, you know. So, so that that's what I started working with. So, so at the same time, working with with the social movement, they're working with the art and creating the posters that were going out as you know uh, a mass. You know, in relation to the masses, you know, with issues, education, and all that. So uh, uh, then, as part of then, oh yeah, hey, backtrack again. During that time, also while I was in school, uh, we we had access to the Friends of Puerto Rico, which was an organization on 30th Street and Third Avenue. They were they were like a, they they were they had a very nice building. And they would, uh, they had a few artists in residence there, and one of them was Carlos Osorio, the painter. And Carlos, as part of his uh, residency, would give uh, classes. Uh, I managed to get a studio there. Adrian Garcia also managed to get a studio. So we were there for a while. 
So we, we became friends with uh, Carlos, you know. Later it happens that Tufino comes from Puerto Rico, and he also goes to uh, the Friends of Puerto Rico. He has a studio there. <coughs> so then there's, then there's this cross-pollination of the, of the young New Yorkian, Puerto Rican artists with the island artists. You know, the two different... Uh, <coughs> Two, two, uh, two, two different, how do you uh, Parts of the puzzle. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, so, yeah. Um, well, in terms of, that, of, the, of those two, the island mainland question in the arts, uh, you know, outside of what was going on politically, what, what were the affinities between the artists that, from the island and the... Um, because obviously, in terms of of of, uh, of a lot the larger issues, social issues, they were the <coughs> same, right? Poverty, education, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, but they might have seen it from a different viewpoint, or were what was the? Yeah, well, they were involved in the '50s uh, movement of of, uh, of printmaking and all that, you know, uh, and. And they were part of the División de Educación de la Comunidad, which is sort of like what we were trying to do here, but we didn't, know, you know, we we didn't even know that it was done before. But being together, they they would let us, you know, they, their stories, you know, linked us in such a way we became a bridge, right. you know, their stories became a bridge between us and the island, and vice versa. And what was interesting is too that uh, both. Uh, Tufino and Carlos were a little bit rebellious also, so they didn't fit the mold anymore in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was becoming like a little too uh, uh, formal, you know. And Carlos was a painter who, uh, more than a graphic artist, and wanted to stretch out, you know. So that whole mold of, of cultural estampillas, you know. They, they didn't want to be dealing with that anymore. They wanted to break out, you know. So by coming to New York and mixing with us, they, you know, it became like sort of like we benefited by understanding the history and the culture. And I think they benefited by looking at the new work that was coming out of New York. The extensions of, the, the yeah. extensions of that. The extensions of, forms. of each, yeah, yeah. So that, that became, that, that, that became, I think, like, like a, a very unique... Uh, um, uh, situation. Were you yeah. exhibiting together there at the at the uh, Friends of Puerto Rico? Yeah, both both together. Both together, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, we exhibited both at Friends of Puerto Rico together, the young and the and the older p artists. Yeah. So um, so that so back to East Harlem. So we formulating in East Harlem. And uh, Manuel Neco, uh, who had been visiting Tufino and, and Carlos at the uh, Friends of Puerto Rico, came back one day and said, listen, fellas, uh, Carlos and Tufino are not happy over there. Let's, you know, bring them in. You know, so we invited them then to join Taller Borico in, in East Harlem. And then they came up to East Harlem. So <clears throat> and they, and, and, they, and for the same reasons too, they were restricted with the Friends of Puerto Rico because they had to do X number of like chores and all that to create their art. So it was like, it, w it wasn't a, a free uh, situation, you know. So uh, so they came up and uh, and and uh, were very instrumental, you know. Like I said before, in 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 those dialogues that we we began to understand what. Uh, uh, what the movement in Puerto Rico was, the graphic movement and all that. We also got a lot of uh, influence from Matorrel. Matorrel was doing, in Puerto Rico, he was doing Taller Alacran. And he was producing a lot of uh, uh, social relevant uh, work. And a lot of the work would often come to, to New York, you know, and, and would be used as part of the propaganda uh, for for the... For the movement, yeah. So, so, so those were. I think those were the early beginnings. Uh, and um, talk about that. That now the development. They you have this cadre of artists at uh, in this Harlem. You had a space, and you and you were already making posters. And 
What about your work at that point? Well, um, is that where you moved to the Taino? Yeah, right. Yeah, at, at that time, uh, I started using a lot of Taino imagery in the work, and uh, and in the posters too. And, uh, and uh, then a lot of the posters would get used, utilized that way. And uh, w one of the activities we would do is we would take art traveling outside of, of the. We would take. We bought a Volkswagen a bus, and we would fill it up with art. We would drive to uh, different locations: the South Bronx, uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, wherever, and set up uh, an exhibition. And then. Uh, of course, bring music and poetry. So we create like a mini like happening, and then the people would come and we start talking about the art. We start talking about the history, sort of like an educational thing. Yeah, so that that was one of the one of the activities of, of the taller. You know, to get uh, um, we decided we go come. We're going to use art as a tool for social change, so uh, in education, and then. We would try to educate um, so-called masses or the people outside, you know, uh, with, what, with, with what we knew, and 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 it, it it became, you know, so the more people knew, it was it became people became interested, other people became more interested, you know. There were there were other, you know, the the theater also, the Teatro Rodante, Miriam Colon. Miriam Colon also, yeah. They were all a generation uh, trying uh, to create this. Exactly. About that time too, Marion Colon was uh, actually in, in the late 60s. She was developing uh, the Teatro Rodante Puerto Rico out of the space at the front of Puerto Rico. Yeah. So uh, she took that out. She so she was doing the theater, the theater work, and then there was other other theater groups also. So there was a, a lot of uh, there was a lot of activity, a lot of young groups. Uh, <clears throat> developing throughout New York, and uh, then we would also go out of New York. We go to Pennsylvania. We go to Boston. Wherever there was a Puerto Rican population, Latino population, we would go out there. You know, if we could. You know, a lot of then uh, an interesting thing happened. Then a lot of the students at the colleges started creating these uh, Black and Puerto Rican Studies departments, or, or whatever. You know. And then they would get monies from the, uh, uh, um, a budget from the colleges, and then they would hire us to go to and, and take these cultural uh, activities to the schools, you know. So then that became another uh, another way of, of disseminating and educating and, and, and spreading the art and. You know that you know find manifesting poetry, music, art. You know? New York Poets Cafe at this time about or later? No, much later. Much later. Much later. Much later okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so you were, uh, you now had uh, uh, a sort of a project for educating the people. Uh, you had a space. You had a group of artists. Tell us a little bit about the ambiente with uh, at at the taller in those early days and how that sort of like. You know the trajectory of that. Um, what role did you play specifically? Because somebody has to sort of like organize or keep together. What was that structure like? Is it, uh, yeah, the structure was, it was interesting. It, it was based on uh, um, what was the word? Uh, we were a collaborative, a, co a collaborative organization. In other words, we decided everybody was going to have like. Uh, a voice and no hierarchy. Everybody's going to uh, be the boss and the janitor at the same time, <laughs> you know. So everybody did everything, you know. Uh, of course, there was seniority because the uh, uh, the longer you were there, or the older you know you had you, you you took over the reins basically. So the, the reins were taken over by by uh, Carlos Osorio first, you know. And then, um, uh, so that, so that was the the form. We we you know, whatever had needed to be done. If it was a print, you know, we would chip in. And, uh, people would, then we had other people to come in and do work, uh, do prints and 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 
they would create their own things and go on to other things. So it, it was also like a nurturing uh, space where artists would come in, learn, nurture, and then create their own uh, things. So, um, so, so based on that, what, what happened was when Marta Moreno Vega got uh, hired as the director of uh, the museo, she came, first place she came was to the taller. I need the help, you know, uh, this, this is what's going on, what's going on. And then <coughs> Nitsa Tufino, uh, Adrian Garcia, and, and Neko Manuel Otero left, oh, and Sammy Tanko. We had, at that time we also had Sammy Tanko, which was one of the planeros. He was doing the, uh, the, the music, uh, one of the music things that we were doing uh, when we would go out. And uh, Sammy went over there to create some uh, bomba and plena workshops, uh, and they were over to physically create the space, not only to teach but to you know construct the, the space. Yeah, so so they left ta taller. Uh, much later, uh, they also created taller Loisa, which was another offshoot of of the taller Boricua, and later on uh, Galeria Morivivi and Galeria Tito, which were offshoots of, of the taller, but, but we encouraged that in a way, you know, because this was, it wasn't about, yeah, it wasn't about like, um, uh, about el elitism, it was about creating, you know, about disseminating, spreading out, you know. But I stayed, I stayed with taller with, with, uh, with, um, with Carlos Osorio, by that time Tufino had left also, he had, he had some marital problems that he was dealing with, so, so he had, he had to leave. And, uh, and then we had a new wave of artists that started coming in. And um, so then Jorge Soto, Mart Martin uh, Ruiz, Mart no, no, Martin, Martin Perez, um, and, um, and Fer uh, Fernando Salicru came in, you know? And... Uh, so um, Fernando and I have been have been helming the the, the taller since since the since the mid seventies. Um, so so that's what happens, you know. And, uh, and then all the artists come in and come and go and come and go. So yeah. And what is the uh, when did you get now uh, the space that you have now and the struggles for that? Oh yeah. Well, it happens uh, with. After the the space at in Madison Avenue, the first space, the first location across the street from the Young Lords, uh, we eventually had to move from there because uh, it, it, um, um, we were sort of like after a while it was um, it, it, it was too cold and all that. It was there was no heat, and uh, we got a space on Second Avenue. And uh, we worked out of there for a while. After that space, we got a space on Madison Avenue, which a loft, which was pretty pretty large. Now, by that time, though, there was uh, a building, that Hexha building, that was on the where Museo is at now, was vacant. And there was an organization called Boys Harbor, which needed to create a consortium of uh, of groups to take over the building. So they came over to us and we said, yeah, we'll do that. We'll, we'll take it over with you. And uh, we were, we came in into that building. We were second group into that building uh, where, where Museo is at now. And Boys Harbor is still there. And uh, and we kept pulling groups in. We pulled the Museo to come in. We, 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 we got uh, other groups. Our mass repertory came in, which is a theater group. Uh, then there was other uh, Puerto Rican uh, educational groups that came in, so so that became um, that became established. So we found, we basically founded that that building. It was a building that was uh, abandoned for a while. It originally was a home, a shelter for for children from the 30s, you know, when there was a lot of uh, wayward children and and homeless uh, children. But by the 60s, there was already, there was more, there, there, there were more uh, people working there than they had kids, you know, because of the, the changing structure right. of society, yeah. 
So it was closed then, it, it closed for a while. So uh, it was open again as a cultural uh, complex. And, um, and we were there in that building for about 10 years, 10, 12 years. Um, but then the rents started, you know, doubling and, doubling and tripling, yeah. And it started becoming a little difficult to keep the space. And then the city then, more or less like what's happening to us now, they wanted to bring in uh, another organization to take the space over. They wanted to bring in the parks department. Because the parks department had lost their space somewhere or whatever they were doing. They wanted to bring in the parks department. So they wanted to sort of like shrink everybody's space. So at that time we negotiated with the city, said, listen, Let's let's bar let's do a bargain let's do a trade off give us a building one of these uh, 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 buildings that that are all over the place that are condemned we'll take care of renovating it and uh, and uh, restoring it and you could have all our space so we did a negotiated sale for something like I don't know ten fifteen thousand very reasonable you know. Yeah, so we bought a building then, and we moved out of the Hesher building, and we started to then uh, renovate that building, sweat equity, and started getting funding and all that. Um, and um, and that that was the period. Where, that was about eighty eighty to eighty six, around there. I think, yeah. And um, and then we bought another building in the corner. We moved to a, a, a four corner, which was, is like uh, a really bad section. It's, it's great now. It's 106 in, in Lexington, but at that time it was it, it, it was uh, infiltrated by uh, drugs and everything was like it was really bad, you know. And uh, but we managed. To, we purchased another building, that corner building. Uh, for artist residencies, and that was on the uh, a program. This woman Janet Langston, she was working with with uh, um, who was the mayor at that time. But her daughter was an artist, and that was good. So she and she had she had some power, and she decided to create this uh, program to give these buildings that were like dilapidated to artists, you know, because artists come in and they, and they spruce them up and they, you know, the quality of life changes and, you know, so, so uh, we fell into that program. We were, we were selected to uh, purchase a building from the city. So we purchased a second building for artist residencies, which is right now in the corner of Lexington and 106. And, um, and it just happens that the school, what is now the Julia de Burgos Culture Center, was a school that was across the street. Again, another school that was, you know, abandoned, abandoned broken windows, graffiti, the whole thing, whole nine yards, junkies going in to shoot up, and the whole thing. And uh, but but we were cons we were we first uh, constructed our building. Uh, and created the galleries in the first floor and artist residencies throughout the building. And uh, that's how the, then the idea came, well, what's happening with that building over there? And uh, a coalition was formed to then create the Julia de Burgos Cultural Center. And eventually that's what happened. But it took about six years of planning and then about another six years of, uh, of, um, fundraising and all that just to get it going, you know? Yeah. So that's how that building came along. You know? in, in your structure, did you have, uh, uh, I imagine, you know, just to keep paying all of this, you obviously had somebody to work with the grants and try to get grants, but I'm sure that it, sometimes people had to dig in and do what they could to keep going. Is it, you know, uh, survival, I guess, yeah. I'm asking. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, we we well, we created the the, the residencies as as an income, you know, rentals, you know. So that was a, a generating factor, an income generating, self self generating 
but besides the grants, we were getting, we started getting granted uh, early in the 70s by the State Council on the Arts. And uh, actually, another thing that goes back to that, because we, we, with the art workers, we, we motivated the, um, the, uh, the State Council on the Arts to create a division to fund like community organizations and it was all, it was pre first called the ghetto arts program you know <laughs> it was later changed to special arts you know because ghetto arts sounds a little too yeah but that that and that was with the art workers coalition and i sat in on those meetings with the with, with the state council on the arts to create something to fund the community organizations because at that time they were you know you know how it goes, like the cultural organizations fund the big, you know, and, and they they take it for granted that those organizations are going to service everyone. Right. The SOPs, they call them, right? The, yeah. The symphony operas and ballets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, but our argument was that our people don't go into those organiz those uh, institutions because, uh, you know... They don't see themselves reflected. They, they don't see anyway. themselves reflected in the whole nine yards. But so, you know, and that we needed to decentralize, not centralize, decentralize the culture and the arts and create community centers throughout uh, the five boroughs, not just in Fifth Avenue, you know? So and that, that was one of the points that we had, uh, the argumental points that we had uh, with the museums, you know, uh, the points that we negotiated. So now you're at the Julio de Burgos Center. You have a, sort of like a satellite where you would do the um, uh, the artists, in re I don't know what you call not an artist in residence, but, you know, where you would have talleres and stuff like that. Yeah, we had both. We had we had in-house talleres, and we also had a, a managed to get a program uh, with the United Way, partly funded by United Way of, of New York and the Board of Ed, where I would um, put artists in residence to give talleres in the schools. You know, so we had we had art, we had uh, music, poetry, dance. Uh, at the schools where I was get, get artists to work at the school so it was those were the satellite programs you know at that period you know prior to that we were doing satellite programs just almost anywhere we would go you know set up a, a workshop or a lecture or, or an activity um, so um, what's the situation now in terms of taller and uh, and particularly you were, did did you come into this uh, consejo? How do you remember that connection? And uh. Uh, I think well, Fernando came to consejo first, right. yeah, and uh, I I believe he uh, became uh, aware of it to the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. And I don't know, uh, I don't remember... Uh, and the center was part of IU PLR, uh, the, 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 you know, the consortium of, of centros. Of centros, right. yeah, right, right. And Hill was part of that. And Hill was part of that, yeah, yeah. And I think that's how we, how we became familiarized with it, you know. We, we, we always had a, a strong tie with a centro. Centro uh, started in... Uh, about uh, about 1974, I believe, something like that, you know. And uh, and then a lot of the same people that worked with Taller were working with them, so there was a very close ties. We started doing like educational material with the Centro, doing posters, doing uh, portfolios of uh, patriots and different things like that, educational material, yeah. And uh, Neko Manuel Otero then also created a faction to just to do um, educational material. So he used some of the artists also. So yeah. So, so the Centro with Frank Bonilla uh, and, uh, and um, a couple other people were, were doing that, and and that's that's how we got 
together with uh, with the Consejo Grafico. And how do you see yourselves now, uh, after so many years and so many struggles? How do you see you know uh, the, the the reality now of, of this enterprise of uh, Arte para el Pueblo? Uh, you know. Yeah. Um, we're, we're still doing a lot of the exhibitions. We do uh, uh, a lot of exhibitions with young artists, uh, with, uh, with themes, uh, contemporary themes. And um, so, so I, I think we're, st we're still promoting the same philosophy in a different manner because it's different times. You know, we don't go out anymore and do gra uh, street uh, uh, gorilla, exhibitions, yeah. guerrilla uh, art, or anything like that. But uh, but we're supporting uh, we, we're supporting the young uh, the younger artists who are working. And um, and then um, another thing that's happening now is beginning to accumulate all the archives and to deal with the history, uh, try to correlate the history and make sense of it and put it out, you know. Uh, so that's one of the projects that we've been doing for the last five years or so. Um, Do you have somebody specifically working on, on the archival? Uh, uh, <laughs> you're, the ar you're the archivist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, well, I'm the, I'm the archivist because I've been there the longest and I know where almost everything is at. Or well, I try to find it, you know. Yeah. And when Jasmine sits down and say, "What happened here?" Well, I gotta tell her. I gotta go back into, oh yeah, you know, then give her examples of what we had, and things like that. So and we physically or they at the central? Physically, or? no, they at the taller. I've okay. given stuff to the central already, but but I'm bringing out a lot of things from the taller. A lot of the, I'm going to a lot of the graphics now, a lot of the uh, you know, posters and different things like that. And find out that we have a nice collection of things, you know. So, yeah. um, and um, so, so that's one thing that I mean that I'm doing now. Uh, um, we're facing a whole series of new challenges, you know, because again, what happened to us at the Hexer Building is starting to happen now with this building at the, the Julio de Burgos Culture Center. Which is that the city is now coming back yeah, in? The artist trying work, to, yeah, and trying to take it they, over. They, yeah, they they they, yeah. they help make everything livable again. And just when you get it, in the you know the the or the gentrification. The again. gentrification is happening, yeah, and uh, the gentrification is happening in East Harlem for sure. Um, and then, um. Like I mentioned before, what happened before at the Hexha building was the city wanted the space for to bring in the parks department. Now they want the space to uh, to tie it in with the theater, uh, and they want new management for the theater, and you know, so it's become another uh, another struggle. And so I I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen with. Uh, but we could always just retrieve and, and make the gallery in our space across the street, you know, if you need, if push comes to a shop. And well, uh, one of the really important things, aside from many, many of the, of the really deep things that the Taller has done, it's also, I think, helped in this transition where, where the barrio is becoming more Latino of different sorts. It used to be a Puerto Rican and maybe some black, but now everyone, Colombianos, Mexicanos, uh, you know, and the fact of, sh of having exhibitions, for example, of shared traditions of Puerto Rican and Chicano posters and things like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. I think really helps the community to understand, you know, yeah, it's not necessarily wanting to take over, we have to learn how to live together, you know, yeah. convivencia, yeah. how to do that, you know. Yeah. And the taller, I think, has been very useful in that sense, helpful. It is, and, and uh, yeah, and we look at art, you know, as as its own, without boundaries, you know, without, uh, you borders. know, it, yeah, without borders. If it, the art is good, is it, it's good, and that's it. That's that's what makes it, you know, um, um, viable, viable, and 
and, and an item to exhibit and, and promote. You know, so that, yeah, so, and, and we've, we've done uh, exhibitions uh, not only of uh, other Latinos, but Koreans, you know, other nationalities, blacks, whatever, you know. We try to be inclusive, you know, because uh, that, that's what art is about, you know. Um, it crosses borders, no boundaries. So, yeah, so, um, so, um, I don't know. But uh, I'm interested in, in, in developing other projects also, personal projects, other than... than uh, like what? Like, well, other painting, graphic, and film projects, you know, uh, that I've been uh, more or less putting on the shelf for a while. And uh, because I also... Uh, I was also involved with the creation of Realidades, the, the national t television uh, Latino uh, program, which started local and then it became national. And uh, that came about in the early 70s also. Uh, um, Jose Garcia, filmmaker, was hired to produce a pilot for WNET on the Latino experience, um, and uh, when he, he produced the, his first film was based on La Carreta, the, I think René Marquez, it's, it's a basic story about a family who leaves, who leaves uh, uh, the countryside, to come to the city, and then, you know, they migration. face all the, yeah, the migration story, yeah. So, <laughs> So Jose did, did it. It was beautiful. They loved it when it was in Puerto Rico. When we got to New York, it got a little political. And then they said, oh, no, this is not a <laughs> this started to ruffle a few feathers. So, uh, so they weren't going to give him the series. So we said, no. So we, got a demo we demonstrated against WNT. We took over the offices and all that. So we did a, a whole series. Uh, we negotiated them, push comes to shove. They um, um, uh, they uh, they they gave over on on the series. Another thing that was interesting then at that time they had the WNET Film and Television School, you know. So then I applied for the Film and Television School and I got into it, you know. So I learned film and television, and then I became a producer for Realidades when I graduated, you know. So, so I was doing films, but way back then, you know. So, um, but but the the interesting thing is that we also developed uh, that program. That bro program became national, and then incorporated like a lot of Chicano uh, uh, producers from uh, across the nation, you know. And uh, it's, it's history. That's also part of history. Yeah. And so you, you're saying now that you. Maybe now also want to develop that again. I want to, like yeah. I want to develop some film, film, some film pro sequences. Pro or yeah, something. yeah. Because I, I feel film is a more, uh, it reaches a broader audience. You know, it's yeah. harder to do, but it, it, but but the rewards are more more gratifying. Well, I think it would be very yeah. interesting uh, instead of going to the classic Rene Marquez stories or whatever. We talk now about our experiences in the U.S. That would be you know, uh, something that would be very useful, I think. I think so, yeah. You know, yeah. So, uh, so personally, I, I, I have a few projects that I'm working on, you know. Do you write the scripts, or do you, or do you have the ideas? And I have the ideas. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a script writer in the sense of, uh, but I produce, so, produce. so I, I could, you know, I could formulate and put and edit, you know, so, um, yeah. I could hire people to write. I did. Uh, I I produced. So I produced a few pieces while you say that is, and then worked on along with other crews as whatever. Can you, know? you tell so us a little bit about some of the pieces you produced? I produced. Uh, okay, I produced uh, a piece called "Towards a Collective Expression," which dealt about uh, the Puerto Rican painters in New York. And then I also produced a piece called Mestizaje, 
which involved three three different uh, segments of theater, uh, Chicano, uh, Cuban, and Puerto Rican, talking about identity at the time. So I let each one of them write their own story, you know, I worked with them, and then we filmed it, you know. So those, those two pieces. Then I worked on juvenile justice piece, I worked on a criminal justice piece, another, another, another piece, uh, not directing it, but, uh, but as camera and editing. So I, I've done a few things along well, those lines. I think we, we might stop here and sort of like hope that, uh, that we'll walk with you when you go up to get your Oscar. <laughs>